Welcome to Talks at Google. Oh my God, what a crowd. Amazing. Um, you are in for a big treat. If you haven't already seen Once on this Island at Circle and Square Theater, please get it together. Get your tickets right now. Uh, we'll wait. Um, not only is this a revival, it's a reimagining of the show. And we are so excited to have the cast and team behind the show here with us today. Please give it up. Before we kick off our conversation, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to invite Lauren Lott, uh, Quentin Earl Darrington, Kenita R. Miller, and Roderick Covington to sing Mama Will Provide. Please give them a big hand. is how you start a show, people. <laughs> um, it is my honor to introduce the Tony-winning um, team behind Once on this Island. Please give it up for Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Okay, I mean, you never heard her do that before. <laughs> Miss Lauren, we are going Thanks. to get to you. Don't worry. <laughs> We're going to talk. Um, thank you all so much for being here. A big welcome to Google. Um, before we get started, if we could just go around and quickly introduce yourself um, and your role on the team. I'm oh. Quentin. I'm Quentin Earl Darrington. I play Ogway, the god of water. 
Hi, my name is Kenita Miller, and I play Mama Uraly. Yes. I'm Roderick Covington. I play a storyteller. <laughs> You're next, baby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lauren Lott, and I understudy Timun, Asaka, and Andrea. Oh. oh. Um, I'm Lynn Ahrens. I wrote the book and lyrics for the show. And I'm Stephen Flaherty. I'm the composer of Once on this Island. Yes. Thank you again. Um, Lynn and Stephen, I'd love to start with you. You've been collaborators since 1982, I think. Is that right? I think 83. 83? Who's yeah. counting? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been so a while. <laughs> How did you find each other? Well, we, we met uh, in a songwriting workshop here in New York City called the BMI Musical Theater Workshop. And... Uh, it was, I was right off the bus from the Midwest and uh, I had the great good fortune that I walked in and uh, in, in, in the class was uh, Lynn Ahrens. And um, I had never collaborated. I was writing music, book and lyrics all myself. And uh, it was, it was a, a wonderful just chance meeting and we just happened to really uh, hit it off and we wrote uh, a not very good song but then followed by a better song and then followed by a better song and uh, it's been 30 some years. Oh, wow. Um, and you wrote Once on This Island, I think, some, something like 27 years ago. Yeah. Um, how did this show come about? What's the origin story? Well, um, when you do musical theater, you never can count on the results. And so we, our first show had gone to Off-Broadway, a show called Lucky Stiff, um, about a, a uh, shoe, shoe salesman who takes a dead body on vacation in a wheelchair. Um, it was it was, it was before very dramatic. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> <laughs> it was before that, and you know, it was off Broadway. It had a limited run, and um, we were sort of desperate to start a next project. And I went to um, a bookstore where they remember bookstores, um, <laughs> and uh, they had a used. Uh, used bookshelf area, and I pulled a little novel off the shelf, and I looked at it, and it was had a very colorful title and colorful cover, and I opened it up, and the first words were, there is an island where rivers run deep, where the sea, sparkling in the sun, earns it the name Jewel of the Antilles. The first words on the page, and I went, oh! This is a musical. And I slammed the book <laughs> shut and I ran home. I bought it for a buck fifty. I didn't even haggle. And uh, <laughs> and I took it home, read it, and took a cab right over to Stevens and I said, I think I found the next show. So that's that's how that happened. Yeah. I, I was just listening to a lot of world music at the time just for pleasure. Uh, Paul Simon had come out with his seminal record, uh, Graceland, which was his voice, but uh, is filtered through the South African music of Lady Smith Black Mombazo. And I was listening to all that kind of stuff just for fun. And I just thought this could be a really cool uh, basis for a theater score that could have uh, world music elements in it. And uh, they never said which island it was in, in, in the book. So I borrowed a little from here, a little from there, uh, some South, uh, South American music, some American gospel, and I just made it uh, my own. You know, and it, it was a fantastic project to work on. It was the fastest writing we had ever done. We wrote pretty much the first draft of the show in six months. Oh, wow. And that's fast. <laughs> <laughs> what is your process like in the room together as collaborators? Like, do you have different styles? How does that work together? Well, over the years, you know, collaboration, you're all collaborators in one form or another. And, and um, what we found in all of these 30 something years that we've been working together is that it keeps changing. So back then we would sit in the room every day at a piano. We would um, work for a couple hours. Then we would have Chinese food. Then we would have coffee. Then we would get over caffeinated. And, and Lynn would say, then, don't eat the egg roll because I would immediately roll, fall, fall asleep. asleep. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to know, don't eat the egg roll. And, and by the end of the day, all the tempos were too fast because we were so hyper from a lot of coffee. And um, that was then. And then we s gradually, you know, switched to decaf and salads. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but the actual working process sometimes it's lyrics first sometimes it's music first a lot of the times it's sort of like a ping pong match where he'll go do 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 you know and I'll say some words and I'll get the computer and we'll start working together and sometimes he'll email me a tune and sometimes I'll email him lyrics in the old days it was faxing or I would I would do dramatic readings on his answer oh, her, her dramatic readings were so great <laughs> she would actually do them in the voice of the character yes. and uh, you know and and uh, I, uh, this was before email, you know, and, and Google. It was before <laughs> it was before. Yeah, the but these were so great. Yeah. These these tapes were great. Wonderful. Oh wow! 
Did you, what's it like to revisit this show now in 2018? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I don't, you're all, you, none of you, I'm quite sure, saw the original in 1990. But um, this is completely different. This incarnation of the show, it, it's like, almost like night and day. Uh, it's very contemporary. It's very edgy. There's real sand, real fire, real water. Uh, it, it is set very groundedly in Haiti after a big disaster. And it sort of relates not only to, you know, Puerto Rico and all the disasters in the world that have ruined and, and hurt communities, but has also brought communities together. And the concept of this production is that the, the people who've all been caught in the storm, um, out of disaster comes beauty and community and music and dance and joy and storytelling. And it is, it's, it has taken the show to another place that we never ever expected. And to be honest, at the beginning, I could not visualize it. I, I, I would come home every night from our technical rehearsals and my, my husband would say, How, how's it going? And I, I would say, I, I just, I have no idea. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in a sand pit and there's, it's strewn with garbage and there's a goat. I don't really know what's <laughs> happening. I couldn't see it. And then little by little, I began to really, really understand and appreciate it. Appreciate it, and it's it's such a beautiful, special production. And these guys are it's it's great. In the first row, they actually have their feet in the sand, in the and sand. the fact that we're doing it in the round is is so uh, revelatory. You know, we, I've only seen it in a proscenium sort of situation, so this is great because it's it's really about a dialogue between the audience and the actors and this cast. They are spectacular. I mean, each and every one of them uh, have been handpicked, and together they just are the most joyous community that you'd ever want to hear. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And um, I would love to talk to, to you all about your involvement with the show before this production, because I know some of you had done this show. Kanita, this is what number is this? I think this is maybe the sixth time. The sixth time. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm going to play Tom Tom next. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's... It's awesome. I, I mean, it is kind of a magical show, you know, not kind of, it is. It's very infectious. And, and this production is my absolute favorite because of the people we it's very spoiling you don't get to pick who you work with all the time right. but we have a great family and um which makes it really easy to kind of try to recreate that community and also just the elements like really it is you know there's a lot of um difficulties to working in sand but there is so much beauty in working in it too. I mean, I take any opportunity to roll around in it when I can. You know? <laughs> it is. It's like it's like really playing on the beach. And as an artist, to have these actual um, elements to to work with, all you have to do is show up and be present. You know, because it's it's not much you have to imagine as far as the environment. It's right there. I mean, Mark, Michael Arden has a beautiful vision for this show. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, I mean, a lot of the elements, literally, like earth, wind, and fire, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, is that, I mean, is that challenging for you as actors to sort of navigate through that and like interact with those elements and then, you know. He's in the he's, water he for the whole water. evening. Right. Right. He's the, splashing yes. the water gone, yes. right. I, I am, I'm in the water, uh, uh, good 40, 50 percent, well, maybe more than that, <laughs> 60, 70 percent of the show uh, through the this entire time. So since I had to stay in the water uh, most of the show, I decided to, you know, make the most out of it and the best out of it. So I play in the water. I throw the water. I splash the water. You know, I and the water are one. So it's a lot, a lot of fun. I, I think you said challenging. Um, I mean, it has some challenges. It's cold some days. It's warmer some days. But, I mean, it's fun. You know, at the end of the day, it's fun. So I don't look at it as a challenge at all. It's, I, I look for every single day as a new opportunities, new blessings, new fun. So it's fun every single day. Lauren, you, we were talking a little bit um, backstage, and you also had an, an earlier experience with Once on this Island. Tell us about that. Um, yes, when I was 15, I was offered the role of Timun and I turned it down because I just thought it was way too big. Um, <laughs> so then they um, had me do Air Zuli instead and I was like a fetus Air Zuli among all of these uh, adults, but that was when I completely fell in love with this show. Oh, wow. So this is, it's, it's fascinating because it's in a way uh, a, re a revisiting and a reimagining for you two, but also for many of the cast members. R Roderick, had you had, did you know about the show? Uh, <laughs> 
No, I, I knew, I didn't know anything about the show. I mean, I knew about uh, Stephen and Lynn um, and their work, but I hadn't seen the show or, I mean, I heard of the show, but I hadn't seen it or anything. But when, um, you know, when we started working on it uh, in the reading, um, actually before the reading, when I got material and just like started working on it, I just fell in love with it, you know, and I was like, oh my God, if there's anything that I want to do in the next season, it is this. And I started praying that I would get the show. <laughs> and I think we all felt that way. You know, it, it just felt like it was meant to be at this time. And there's something about it being very timely. And, uh, from the minute uh, we had our first meeting with Michael Harden and Ken Davenport, our producer, and our two orchestrators, Michael Starobin and Anne-Marie Malazzo, from that time till uh, we said yes, and then from the, from the moment of yes to we're in front of an audience, it was only a year and a half, which is really fast. You know, because we've been pushing other shows like very slowly along. But this one, I think everybody just thought this is the time to do this, and there was an urgency about it. Yeah, I mean the show does feel very current. I mean, it's what what was what was that decision making process like? Like, how did they approach you about it? Uh, what was what were the conversations like? And, and why why is now a good time for this show? Well, right now is a great time for theater. Period. Because look where we are. We need community. We need to get in the same room. We need to have dialogue. That's what theater is. So, you know, it's it's our show. Feels very topical. But I think almost any show feels very to topical at the moment. Um, uh, Michael Arden is a genius. I think um, he's very. He was an actor to begin with, and he's an amazing actor and an amazing singer. And who knew that he had this directorial genius in him as well? He did a show on Broadway um, a few seasons ago called Spring Awakening. It was a revival, and they did it with the Deaf West Theater, right? And it was all signed, and it was beautiful. And when he came to us, first of all, he wanted to do this show a cappella. And we objected to that. And we said, you know, we don't, we, we need a drum. We need some music. I, I, I just thought it was going to be like a yeah. doo-wop thing. I said, is yeah, this going to no. be like the pentatonics? I said it to, you know, <laughs> it felt very odd to me. And I said, you need a drum. You need this primal drum. You need a bass. And then we had more conversations. And yeah. And he, he brought us drawings. He started to bring drawings and show us visuals of, you know, that were, not exactly like what we've ended up with, but they implied Haiti, they implied children, they implied, you know, certain magical elements um, and fantastical elements and certain very grim elements as well. And what we've realized along the way with Michael is, and, and we kept saying, well, oh, that's interesting. Well, why don't you go away and bring us the broomstick of the Wicked Witch and then we'll talk again. And then he would bring it back and we would talk again. And finally he won us over. We thought this, this all sounds good and interesting. And, you know, the whole point of doing a revival is to do something different. It, the show has been established in one way, and why not try to shake it up and do it in a different way? So as the authors, it, it's a big risk, because Once on this Island gets done all over the country in schools, and, you know, it's sort of a wonderful, beloved show in a way for generations of people. And so, you know, to say, okay, you can bring it back to Broadway, and we don't quite understand your concept, but it sounds really interesting, was a risk for us. Well, the, the thing that was exciting, though, is from the very first meeting, he wanted he wanted it to be very ritualistic. He wanted to do it in the round. He wanted to have the audience very close and participating uh, in the story. And of course, there's only one Broadway theater that is in the round. And so there was no plan B. So it's like either we had to be in circle in the square or or, or not do it. And uh, we, we were, we just, I think we just willed it into being. We just really imagined it. And uh, we were fortunate that that uh, they they wanted our show and we wanted to be there. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious um, about sort of like the process of growing up with this show. Like you did, Kanita. We didn't mention this, but you actually played T Moon. Um, how has your relationship with the show, I mean, over six times, has it changed? Has your understanding of the characters changed? Um, most definitely. I'm, <clears throat> I always joke, I'm definitely not waiting for life to begin anymore. <laughs> T Moon with a walker. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have fallen in love with Mama Yearly. I really have. Um, one, because I have aspirations to be a mother. And I think so that really speaks to my womb. <laughs> and, and, Keep saying, don't do it yet. <laughs> don't do it yet. <laughs> um, and also, too, I, um, the, this character, I, I, it reminds me of my mother. 
And uh, my mom actually did some uh, missionary work in Haiti, and she was actually assigned to orphaned children and uh, was in, in kind of a part of putting a school to back together. And so I went back and looked at a lot of the pictures that she brought from, and it's crazy because the uniform that the little girl wears in the show is almost identical to what these kids had in, in, my, in the photos with my mom. So it, I mean, this show has always been really special to me. It was one of the first, because I got started in musical theater really late. It was one of the first shows that I saw myself in. I saw, you know, people that looked like me. And, um, and yeah, so, I, and, and the music is infectious, infectious, you know, and the, the story is, um, I think, you know, it has, has its, its own magic to it. And then putting it all together, it is. It's something that I think a lot of people hold very dear to them. And I don't even know if you, like Lynn and Steven, if you know what you would, you know, were starting when you wrote it. Like it really is, is something that um, I think a lot of, even if you don't like theater per se, it's something that just really captivates you, and and it has done that to me since the beginning. Yeah, I mean, this is a real treat for me because this is you know one of my favorite Broadway scores of all time. Uh, I gave him five dollars to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, every mention is another five. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Broadway score of all time. <laughs> um, um, and it's it was fascinating to hear while I was uh, you know preparing for this. Um, you had had relationships with some of these these marvelous actors, uh, Quentin and and Kenita, You had actually worked together in yeah. in Ragtime. In Ragtime. Ragtime, they were Cole yeah. House yeah. and Sarah. First show yeah. ever out of school. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your equity card? It was. It definitely was. Yeah. She was amazing. When we yeah. couldn't believe her the first time we met her. She's so tiny, and she just has this <laughs> enormous voice and this yeah. enormous soul, and she's incapable of doing anything false. She's, oh, we it's we not, do collect actors. We do collect, collect. actors. We do. We, the, we You also learn to weed out some of them. <laughs> you know? That's true. Stay tuned for the after yeah. show, everybody. <laughs> we'll tell you later. No. But, but we, 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 we absolutely adore this cast, and, and many we've worked with before. Some we haven't, you know. And it's, will again. And yeah, and it's and it's yeah. so exciting. You know, you collect them. Yes, um, Quentin. What was it? What's it like to be back on stage with Kanita? Is it? I'm oh, so it's many years everything. Ago. It's everything. I, I actually told my uh, my cast the first day of one of our workshops. I walked in the room, and they asked, uh, "So, what is the most exciting part about today?" Michael Arden asked us all to say, "What's your most exciting part today?" And think something you may be the most trepidatious about today. And I said, "The most exciting thing about today is that I get to work with and hear and see my favorite uh, singer uh, on Broadway, and it's Kanita." You know, uh, from day one, I've known Kanita now since 2001 when we started Ragtime together with Lynn and Steven. Uh, so it's been a long time and she's been my friend ever since and met her husband the same tour, the same show uh, back then. So I've known the both of them this whole journey. So it truly is family, man. It's, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world. It's awesome. That's awesome. Miss Lauren. Can we talk? We can talk. <laughs> you know, I feel like Joan Rivers up here. <laughs> can we talk? Um, so, you know, first of all, that performance, just please, another round of applause. I mean, that was <laughs> just like blown away completely. And actually, the night that I was seeing the show, we saw it with you um, as T Moon. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know that. You didn't yeah. tell me that this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know, um, and you had never done that song, right? Mama will provide you. They've, ne uh -uh. you know, none of you had ever seen her do it, right? No, we walked in this morning and we said, really? <laughs> okay. we, we, we were told in the it. elevator coming up here, and I'm like, well, that's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's live theater. <laughs> you never know. The struggle. <laughs> the struggle. So you uh, play a lot of different roles in the show yeah. um, w Timun, um, Asaka, and. Andrea. Andrea. Everybody. Yeah, she plays every. Okay. Every so, woman. Every woman. <laughs> um, what is it like preparing for those roles? I mean, what you know, in any given show, like, what is what are you thinking about? What are you you know what are you working on? Um, it's kind of hard to to prepare uh, because a lot of times it's really last minute. Yeah. Um, 
if I'm fortunate enough to know ahead of time, each character I feel like has different needs and wants different things. So I try to spend at least a little bit of time before that remembering what they want and remembering who they are. Because if there's times when I'm on as several different people, then I definitely will um, will get confused. But going on for T-Moon is probably um, the easiest one to go on for because she has a consistent story. Mm-hmm. And she's in it the entire time. And being in the round, you can just walk into the world. Mm-hmm. And then you're, um, I'm like in the world. So it's easiest to like be be focused there. But usually I just call my vocal coach before um, the shows and just run it run it with her when I know that I'm on as um, Team Moon. When I'm, I've never gone on for Asaka. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's coming. <laughs> and I mean, to prepare for that, um, <laughs> I'll probably take a really nice shot of oregano oil. Uh, get my voice ready. Uh, <laughs> um, but when I prepare for Andrea, uh, I, I just look at a lot of my notes. And um, yeah, that, that's it. That's like a kind of like she's mostly ensemble and then she's like a character. So then I just I just prepare for, for prepare like that. But I can't really prepare like... Um, like how you would for a regular show because I'm thrown on. So I, I don't get to like, I get to focus, but I, there's a lot going on when I'm, when I'm on. And there's a lot to remember because I'm working with a lot of people behind the scenes to help me remember certain things, like my shoes. Like one time I went on and they didn't have my, my shoes. So I went out barefoot, which is fine, we're in the sand. But um, I mean, it's happened like, like several times. So then I, we have to like be communicating back, backstage. So there's a lot going on. So I'm not exactly like as focused as I'd like to be most of the time, but um, I do the job. <laughs> she's unbelievable. She's like a little, like a little rocket scientist with all of these charts and graphs and things. And she just, she's amazing. Lynn. <laughs> Pretty rocket scientist. <laughs> do you, how do you keep these characters, you know, sort of organized in your head? Is it, I mean, you have, you know, you're memorizing lines for all three of them. What's, the, I mean, is that hard to keep track of? Well, praise God, when I was little, um, my <laughs> hobby when I was doing shows, because I started when I was seven and then my mom pulled me out because she was like, no, I don't want you to grow up and like, you're not going to be able to use the bathroom by yourself because you're going to be famous and you're not going to be able to go to like Disneyland because people are going to follow you to the bathroom. So I was like, dang, I want to go to the bathroom myself. So I did, so I like, <laughs> so I didn't do it. <laughs> so I didn't do it for a long time. But when I started at seven, I like really... <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed um, <laughs> memorizing plays. Uh, like, like when I was in a show, I liked to know everybody's lines and I liked to memorize everything. And then it came in handy because uh, now doing, doing this show, I have memorized everybody's lines mm-hmm. and everybody's everything, but I keep a lot Watch of Watch out. <laughs> I'm coming She's for you. He's coming after way. you, Roderick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roderick. I'm coming for you. And I keep a lot of videos. Videos are like my Bible. Like I, I go through my videos like every other um every other night and I just try to remember like like who's doing what. But a lot of times, even when I'm on stage, I'm like watching everybody and watching watching everybody who I cover, trying not to miss anything so I can stay like up to date. Like if one character does something with another character and that becomes like their thing, I try to make sure I know it so that I can come and do their little like thing you know I'm always it's always going I'm like I'm losing it (laughs) you're hiding it well um how are you all preparing for these roles I mean you're on stage for 90 minutes you don't really leave right do you leave I mean you know for the most part you're there no no we're all we're all pretty much all on stage the whole show we leave maybe for a quick second, then right back out all the time. I heard um, Alex talking about this idea of a snack track. Can you tell us what a snack track is? <laughs> <laughs> and how- a snack track is, is, is a track in a show where you may have one song and you stay off stage for most of the show. <laughs> so you come on, you kill it, and then you leave. You know, I often, I, I used to consider that to be like Mufasa in The Lion King. Okay. Now, I, I played Mufasa and I love the track. You sing one song <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> And then you stay back the whole second act. You're in your dressing room chilling. And oh, that's snacking. a snack track. Okay. <laughs> and there are no snack tracks in this show. No. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, tell me about that's that. It's amazing. It's delicious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. 
What? <laughs> can you see her as, a, as the demon of death? Oh, for those of you that don't know the show, you're so sweet. But I could just see, you know, embodying that. Tell me, what's that? What's that process like? And how do you? How are you creating that character? But also as a storyteller, like, how are you? What's your character development like? I mean, you know, I, I, when I first like auditioned, everything was for Papa Gay. So everything that I was doing in preparation was for Papa Gay. And so just going in it, you know, like I, I just saw myself as Papa Gay and I had to adjust more and to get, and get more into the, to, to, as a storyteller. And that the storyteller is actually much more work than Papa Gay because um, the storyteller is like constantly on stage and, and moving and changing and I mean, doing so much as, as Papa Gay, you know, there's this, this one linear and, 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 and I, I really feel like like I was already prepared, you know what I mean, for that, you know, in, in just the root of it, of even where Papa Gay comes from, even just from, from you know, the voodoo. Um, and so it just, like, doing that just honestly just feels just, like, completely right. Um, you know, I don't ever get to do that often, but <laughs> when I do. <laughs> we love it. Yeah, and she's incredible. Yeah, yeah, we have a woman playing the god of death. Yeah which is traditionally a man's role, and we have a man playing Asaka, Mother of the Earth, which yeah. is traditionally a woman's role. So we've shaken up the genders a little bit yeah. in this production, which also, also makes it really contemporary in a way yeah. and feel unusual. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Um, let's, uh, we want to open it up to questions from the audience. If you want to line up at the mics on either side, we'll be happy to take your questions. Um, let's talk about this non-traditional casting. First of all, you all have some really non-traditional castmates. Live animals. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, you know, you're working with goats. There are chickens in the show. Yes. And I actually heard we were talking a little bit backstage. A chicken gave birth. Is it? Is this? Oh. Yeah, they 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 lay eggs. They lay now. eggs. Yes. Which is good. It means they're comfortable. But, but yeah, we had one lay. I think it was either Laurel or Effie, because we have four of them. And they're all named after the Dream Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was one of them actually laid an egg right there during the pre-show. So we get fresh organic <laughs> eggs. We don't tell them though. <laughs> Do they get their own dressing room? Or oh, they yes. They have their own room in the back. They actually have an animal taxi yes. that picks them oh. up from their farm and takes them yeah. to the theater. Well, okay. It's kind of, yeah. They've got the life. They have awesome. got the life. No. <laughs> These are, are Broadway you? chickens. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they all have contracts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and agents, you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, take a question over here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I've seen the show twice. I love it. I have a question about the instruments because there's a lot of interesting instruments, and I'm curious how uh, those have changed uh, for this production than before. Yeah. Uh, originally, we had a little band of five people, so they're like a little Caribbean band, but off Michael Arden's idea of what if everything was taken from you? How would you create music? How would you tell your story? Uh, we... we came upon the notion of actually inventing uh, some instruments that are made out of discards, you know, out of trash, out of found objects. And our orchestrator, Michael Sterbin, has a good friend named John Bertels, who has a group called Bash the Trash. And that's literally what they do. They make uh, instruments out of trash. And there's something about making music or repurposing something to, uh, to create a thing of beauty, which we were really excited about. So they play all sorts of little s strange and interesting things throughout the show. tubes that are actually pitched, so it's like E flat, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. And, and that we have a little girl in the show, two little girls actually, and they're both musicians, very, very talented musicians. And I love when one of them is, uh, is in the show and, and she's a cellist and she plays a little cello, but it's made out of, I think, a cardboard box and some mm -hmm. strings and wires and stuff. And it's just adorable, you know, and it actually plays. So it's 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 all that glass scope bottles and all sorts of good stuff. So we still have our little uh, uh, our, our little combo, our little uh, island band, but with with the trash instruments. And also, we're we were experimenting with the idea of instead of using synth pads like we did originally, uh, creating those textures with the human voice. Voices. And, and so yeah. we have a beautiful uh, vocal arrangement uh, that's that functions as part of the orchestration created by uh, Anne Marie Malazzo, who did all the vocal work on Spring Awakening. And she's like wildly inventive, and uh, and they're they're amazing that they can execute the, this stuff. And all it's that's tricky. new in this in this it's production. Yeah, yeah. Cool. so yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Did you um, 
I mean, what's it like to hear the music with those sort of found objects and instruments? Is it like, well, you know, the whole thing was a, a big process of experimentation. I, I think it's there's something about knowing that the rev- going into a revival where you know that the show itself works. So it actually frees you up to try a lot more. Uh, other things, and, th- and this is one of the things, and it, and it was sort of like a, we had a series of small workshops where we would experiment with these vocals and then these th- these ideas for the instruments, and uh, it's a- it actually, using the voice, it actually makes the show more human, because actually it's different uh, different voices supporting the other voices, and there's something about that that just grabs you. Great. Um, let's take a question over here. Um, I've uh, loved this score for a long time, listened to the soundtrack many times, and uh, waited many years for revival, and this one was amazing. But I always uh, thought that maybe it wasn't revived uh, on Broadway because it's short, it's like a one act. Am I, was I right about that? And if I was, why did you ever consider making it longer? I, I don't think it was the length. I don't think it was the length either. It, it, it seems like these days, theater pieces want to get shorter and movies are just getting longer, you know? I mean, movies are so long now. But uh, I, I don't think that that was ever an issue. I know when we took it to, to London, uh, the London people, they liked that full night out. And they said, can't we create... Can't we go to the bar? Can't we cr- go to the bar? Can't we create... And, and we said, no, it really doesn't want to break. So what they did is they uh, they ripped apart the theater and, and they made it in, into a Caribbean village. And they had all sorts of like Caribbean... Goat pies. And- goat pies and Caribbean bands playing after. So they had like an after show kind of thing. So it was like you could just hang and do I think, that. I think it's just taken this long because... It's just taken this long, you know? It just, it, I don't think there's any real reason other than somebody, it just takes somebody to fall in love with something and have a vision for it and say, I want to bring this back, you know? Um, so it just, it just... There, uh, there, were, there was always talk about revivals, yeah. but I'm, I'm glad it, it didn't happen until now because I think yeah. we needed to wait for the right group of people to manifest themselves and sort of show up in time. Yeah. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to, for coming to Google. This question is mainly for Lynn, because I was really struck by how you mentioned the importance of community and the arts bringing us together. Uh, I work on YouTube, so I'm always very curious and excited when creators come in. How do you think that YouTube specifically, maybe Google in general, could do a better job of supporting the arts and engaging those conversations through our online platforms? Uh-oh. Well. <laughs> um, I think you do a great job to begin with. I, I, you know, it's years ago. I did a, I wrote songs and sang for a show called Schoolhouse Rock, which maybe some of you grew up with, and they're all on YouTube. And so I can see my life flashing before my eyes sometimes, you know. And I, it's extraordinary to me um, how so many you can find so many things on on there and and through Google. I mean, almost, you know, the the knowledge of the world at our fingertips, and 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 I love that. I don't know how you could do a better job, but maybe is there a theater channel in your future or something? Um, you know, live performance is very ephemeral. Uh, you know, you, you see it one night and Alex Newell is playing Asaka. You see it the next night and uh, Lauren Lott is playing Asaka because Alex got ill or whatever. You know, one night an actor is on, the next night they're not as good because they're not feeling as well or whatever it is. So, you know, to capture live theater, I think, in and is very important. And the more we can do that within legal limits, the better. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that people, you know, sort of hold hold the camera up and then stick it under their coat or something. And you know, we don't want that, but so much. But maybe there's something in that idea. I don't. I don't know how you would do your job better. I'm always like, I feel I'm in the heart of technology right now. It's like the, the belly of the beast. It's really cool. <laughs> there's something really exciting though about the idea of global community because that really didn't exist, you know, before the advent of the internet and, and yeah. all of that. That's right. I find I, that. That's potentially really exciting. Yeah, the idea just, of that interfacing. Yes, exactly. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Quentin, we me. were talking a little bit about craft and mm-hmm. you know, sort of, um, you know, learning your craft and honing your craft. Ha- and like, you know, what's what's your perspective on the whole sort of digital landscape um, as it relates to like you know young artists coming up? You know, obviously a lot of people are getting discovered on YouTube. 
Um, what's your what's your relationship with that? What's your perspective on it? It's interesting because in this age of, of social media, things things are so 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 fast. Information moves so fast. We learn so fast, and um, which honestly, uh, in a lot of t- times, makes audience members' attention spans shorter. And uh, just like we said with shows getting shorter and shorter and shorter, uh, these quick blurbs, these quick things, not too many people are taking the time to read as much anymore or to take the time to really sit through a three and a half hour uh, production. I hear Angels in America is back and it's an event and <laughs> which I can't wait to see, you know, and to be a part of. Um, um, I think there's some pros and some cons, you know, to to the way this push has happened uh, for us all moving forward. But I hope that there's a happy medium that we can continue to find artistically, creatively, and for uh, our human uh, nature and growth all across the board to keep growing and producing great art and great people. Yeah, Lauren, you were on American Idol. Um, you've done a lot of film and TV work, but we're talking a lot about live theater. Um, what's it like doing, you know, what's it like being back in the theater? Um, do you have a, pr- you know, do you prefer one over the other? What, what are the differences? Um, I go back and forth because sometimes I prefer theater, but I prefer theater when I'm, when I'm working on TV and film. And then when I'm working on TV and film, I feel like I prefer like TV and film because there, there is something really nice about like doing one scene and then if I like mess it up, just doing it over and over again and then going back to my trailer and like napping. <laughs> and then like crafties, which like when you're on a set, there's like food everywhere and it's called crafties and they become your best friends or they become my best friends. <laughs> but I love that. I love crafties because <laughs> in theater, I remember during our first few rehearsals, I hadn't done um, theater in a while and I was like, so where's crafties? <laughs> and, and Alex Newell laughed at me. <laughs> and then we became friends. <laughs> but I think um, right now, uh, theater like this, like in, in our worlds, because I feel like we're actually in, in our own little world and it's really, really special and it's really different than, in, than any other show that I've done. So right now, I prefer the round, I prefer theater. Yeah, what, um, one of the last songs in the show, or actually the last song, is why we tell the story. Can you talk a little bit about like why you all tell the story and, and what the show means to you? <laughs> um, well, I have 18 brothers and sisters um, in Florida. My parents had 19 kids. And, and, and I have like over 150 nieces and nephews because all of my siblings have kids except my brother and I who are the 18th and 17th. And then their kids have kids and kids and kids. And so like it's just... It, it really is a village and like, you know, our community and tribe. And, and so every time that I, we get to that part and, you know, the, the little girl reminds, of, reminds us of the story, like my heart wells up every time because I think of my nieces and my nephew, particularly Tyra and Tori and just like how, you know, like we, you know, my, my life right now, you know, has to be about them. You know what I mean? And no longer about like, you know, me, you know, um, you know, because it's about the next generation, you know, and that's why I tell the story. And that's why, you know, I'm so grateful that, you know, like I feel in alignment of being a part of this particular production because it's about like the next generation. And so, yeah. Uh, uh, I tell the story because I have to. And um for similar reasons, but also to not to forget. Um, We say hope is why, faith is why, love is why, grief is why, pain is why. And I think that they are all emotions that make us so beautifully human. And, And it's okay to feel all of those things. It actually is what connects us. And we have strength in, in our emotions and, and, we have strength as being a hu- human being. <laughs> and um, so I think when I think of all those words and why they're important, it always comes down to making me remember how resilient we are when we come together and when we allow ourselves to live in our humanity. What have the fans' reactions to the show been like? Um, you're obviously interacting with the audience during the show, but have you heard from fans? Do you hear from them a lot? I can imagine. Lauren, do you want to? Oh, yeah. Or Lynn? Yeah. 
Um, I definitely, I think we all have our own experiences with, with supporters, but uh, me being an understudy, I didn't really expect much. Um, I expected to be supporting everybody else while they're being supported. But the uh, like the the younger audience, especially on social media, they'll like draw pictures or every time that I'm on as a different character, if I post it and they haven't seen it before, they'll um, draw pictures or they'll send letters. I just received some once on this island custom shoes some that real. someone <laughs> some Nikes that someone made. <laughs> yeah, and I also, I'm always posting that I love hot sauce, so sometimes when people come to the show, they'll bring me goodie bags, and it'll have, like, candy in it, or, like, a nice letter, and hot sauce, <laughs> and I have received a lot of hot sauce, and I, it's, like, filling up in my room, and everyone judges me, but it's just, like, it makes me so happy that people give me hot sauce, like, people actually, like, hear me, and they, like, see me, and then they get excited, people are always asking me, like, about my team moon dates and stuff, and they, like, try to plan um, around when to come back based off of that, and it just makes me feel really, really special. Mm-hmm. Hot sauce, everyone. Please bring some. <laughs> <for hot sauce>. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, did you want to say something? No, no. no. I mean, that, that's, they don't bring me hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, Yet. And, and when I come out of the theater, you know, there is always this huge line of fans waiting for all these guys, and I just sneak out the other way, and nobody has a clue who the writers are. You know, nobody ever does. But what we do get as writers is, um, you know, people come up to us and say, uh, I got married to the human heart, uh, or that sort of thing. Or one woman said she gave birth to waiting for life to begin, which really? I thought was, ho- I swear, wow. was hilarious to me. Did she put uh, it on a loop tape? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> or did she do it in like three push, and a half do, minutes? Do, yeah, it's like... do, 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 push. I don't know how she did it. But, <laughs> she, I, but um, you know, we, we do, we hear a lot from people who saw the original and uh, are knocked out by the revival, they had no idea. Or a lot of people who never saw the original, like probably your age, who have grown up with the album, uh, for the original album, and are coming to see it and saying, oh my God, I, I just never visualized it like this, it's so stunning. So, you know, we hear from a lot of people, we do. Wow. Yeah. Um, you guys have like the best cafes and food here. <laughs> and, and when we were just there eating lunch, Lauren asked for hot sauce. She was, she was on the mission to find some over there. <laughs> Official Google hot sauce. Right? Official Google. It's in the Google vision. It's the Google vision. <laughs> um, uh, before we close, we're going to close with two songs. I um, want to play a quick game with you all, if you're, if you're up for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to play a, a version of the Proust Questionnaire. This is from the 1880s. It's since been updated for this mm-hmm. talk. Um, but we're just going to popcorn around, ask questions. You know, Feel free to answer with the first thing that comes to mind um, and just pass the mics around. Sound good? Yes. Okay, great. Um, what is your greatest extravagance? This is me. Any, anyone, anyone. Hot can. sauce. <laughs> I like where this is going. <laughs> we, we just go around. Cabs. Yeah. <laughs> Cabs. Food. Ooh. Food. Take out. Hey. <laughs> is it, yeah, it's, that takes a lot of my money. <laughs> <laughs> Seamless is a luxury. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, go to audition song. Feeling good. Mm. God bless a child. Mm. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Word or phrase you overuse? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that she does. <laughs> Chillax. Oh, I don't Chillax. Know. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. <laughs> um, cast album you play in the shower? Rain. Singing in the rain. No. Oh. I play Rain in the shower. I actually listen to Alex Newell's Spotify channel in my shower. Yes. It gets you going in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Check him out on Google Play, everyone. <laughs> right. I said the S word. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, role you've always wanted to play? Uh, Eartha Kitt. Eartha Kitt. Yeah. Amber. Betty Comden. Ooh. Mufasa. <laughs> yes. Okay, we're going to end on Mufasa. Please uh, give them all a big hand. You're great, you guys. Thank you all so much. And please welcome back um, Quentin Earl Darrington uh, to sing Rain. And uh, he will be followed by Miss Lauren Lott singing Waiting for Life. Please keep it going for them. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect.
Let there be no Let the clouds race by Where the road meets the sea Let the tide be high Let there be a girl Walking by the sea In the pouring rain Rain on the road Rain on her face Rain makes a road Such a dangerous place Let there be a car Racing through Let their fate begin in the rain. 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 lot to seeing Waiting for Life.
you remember your little team move from the tree? Wake up, look down, hear my prayer. Don't single me out and then forget me. Oh, God, oh, God. Keep it going. <laughs> Woo! Get your tickets and go see Once on this Island at Circle in the Square Theater. Thank you all for being here. Have a good day.